So, okay, so we just finished yesterday. We just finished the or last week. We just finished um, doing the Word of God study with Jordy. And today we're getting together for the discipleship study, right? So we're pulling, we're pulling the brothers in. We're, we're sitting down with Jordy. And we're going to look at some biblical discipleship, right? And this study, this is the, this is the first study that's really confrontational, right? Of like, really, we really have to confront, and the scriptures are really going to confront people where they're at. The first couple of studies, they're convicting, right? Seeking God, we got to do it with all our heart. The word of God, right? That we, the word has to be the standard. Um, and it's convicting. It's super convicting, right? It's like, man, this is, because a lot of times it's like, man, I, people may agree, but in the back of their head, they're like, I'm not doing this. I'm not, I haven't been doing this, but I should be doing that. And it's, you know, you kind of get sobered up there. And the Lord willing, these people, the people who are saying the Bible, if they make the decision, hey, the Bible is going to be my standard, right? Because it, it, until you, you, there's that, there's that decision that's made and there's that agreement that the, the Bible is going to be the standard then it's, it's, I mean, you, you have nothing to really go off of, right? You have nothing to put a stake in. You have nothing to, uh, cause if they, if they don't, if they don't want to do it, they're like, I don't, yeah, that may be what it says. I don't, it's not really my deal though. Right. So to take it any further in the studies, we've got to uh, uh, get people to agree that the Bible is going to be their standard. Right. So I'll, I'll usually open up and say, hey, you know, like, so what have you been learning from the study so far? Hopefully they've been going over their notes, having quiet times. But so, so we sit down here, we get Jordy. We got some of the guys like, hey, Jordy. So, so Jordy, uh, uh, first of all, how, how's school been going? How's school starting off? Oh, good. Good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, man. Um, so, yeah. So what do you, what have you been getting from the, uh, the studies thus far? Um, he's like, man, it's been awesome, man. I've never really seen the Bible like this. Um, but great, man. What's, what's really stuck out to you? Oh, uh, it's a lot, you know, and it's, so we have to do like, sometimes people will just be like encouraging. They'll be like, yeah, this is awesome. 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 But we need to be like, okay, tangibly though, like what have you taken? Right. And so we need to make sure that at the very least, right. We got, okay. From the seeking God study, that was all about seeking God. Right. But how do we seek God? Oh, uh, I mean, we got to do it with all our hearts. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, Jordy. What else? Oh, uh, through the Bible, right? Absolutely, Jordy. We got to see God, but we don't can't just do it our, our own way, right? We have to do it through the Bible. Absolutely. And then the next study we did, Jordy, was the Word of God study, right? And that study was all about what? And Jordy says, oh, like, you know, we got to do the Bible, right? Like, we, we really got to... Uh, uh, um, like make the, make the Bible like our standard. Absolutely. Right. Um, did anything stick out, out to you there? Yeah. I mean, Hebrews four, like the word cutting was, was super convicting and yeah, man, absolutely, man. The word's going to cut us and yeah, totally, totally, man. I, I'm glad you, uh, I'm glad you re really retained what we looked at. Um, but before we get into it, why don't we uh, say a prayer? So say a quick prayer. Lord God, thank you for Jordy. Thank you for this Bible study and be with us during this time. And uh, uh, amen. All right. Say a quick study or say a quick prayer. And then we say, all right, Jordy. So today's study, what we're going to look at is not just how we see God or not just what the standard needs to be, but today we're going to look at the life aspect as well. Right. And to sort of connect what I'm talking about, let's go to first Timothy chapter four. Let's go to first Timothy chapter four to open things up and here in first timothy chapter four uh jordy you want to read this one you want to read verses uh, uh 15 and 16 oh yeah yeah totally man awesome awesome go ahead be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 
And Jordy, here with the description talks about it says, we need to watch what? We need to watch what closely? Our life and our doctrine. And so far through the studies, Jordy, but we've really taught, we've really focused in on doctrine, right? That the Bible is going to be how we see God, that the word of God is going to be the standard. Now, today, we're going to look at the life because God sees it equally as important, right? That it's not just what we believe in our doctrine. It's how we're actually applying it to our life. In today's study, we're going to match up our life and our doctrine. Does that sound good, Jordy? Yeah. Yeah, man. Let's do it. Awesome, Jordy. Let's go here to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And here, Jordy, um, here, we're, we're going to pick it up here in verse 16. And do you see that? Do you see the title of that? Um, oh, the Great Commission? Yeah. Yeah, Jordy. said, so you know what a commission is? Oh, is it like part of like what you make when you like sell something? Yeah, I mean, that's one form of it. But here, when it talks about the Great Commission, what it's talking about is a command. So this is the great command of God, right, of Jesus Christ. And let's read this here, and uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Corey read this one. Corey, you want to read this for us? Awesome, awesome. Great beard, by the way, Corey. Uh, thanks, man. All right, go ahead. Let's read 16 through 20. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All right. All right, Joey. This is a fairly powerful passage here, huh? Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely, bro. So, so what, what's, what's Jesus trying to, can, what's Jesus trying to communicate here? What's, what's his message? Um, um, we talking about like disciples, right? Yeah. 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 What, yeah. So first let's sort of break it down, Jordy. First he says in verse 18, he says, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So, Jordy, if Jesus has all authority in heaven and he has all authority on earth, what does that say about him? Oh, I mean, he's God, right? Like, he, if he has all authority in heaven, yeah. So, he's saying, he's saying, I'm God. I'm God. And what does he say? What does he say that uh, uh, his, he wants us to do then? Oh, uh, okay. Well, he says, he says, uh, he says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. It says, therefore, so he's saying, because I'm God, because I can tell you what you, what I, what I want you to do. This is what it is. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. So here he says he wants who to become disciples, Jordy. Oh, all nations. Right. So who do you think that includes? Everybody. Yeah. Jesus wants all people to become disciples. Absolutely. Then what does he want to do? Then, then what does he want us to do? Uh, then he says, uh, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Totally. Totally, Jordy. And, and what, what we got to understand here is this is Jesus's, these are Jesus's last words. Before he, he ascends to heaven, these are his last words to his guys. So we we got to understand, Jordy. Like if you're not going to see somebody for another 10 years, right? Or if somebody's, you have a family member, a friend who's passing away, you know, these are going to be their, their last words. Do you think you're going to want to pay close attention to what they're saying? Oh yeah. Yeah. And he, okay. It's so not how much, how much more for God, right? These are his last words. These are his last words while he was here in a physical form until he's going to come back on judgment day. And so here he tells us to do three things, Jordy. Well, so we, we can break it down into three things. He says, do, he says the one, he says, go make disciples. 
of all nations. Jordy, what's the second thing he says to do? Uh, baptize. Yeah, he says, go make a disciple and then baptize them. And then what? Uh, teach them to obey. Yeah, he says, teach them to obey everything. And so this is, this is what's interesting here, Jordy. Look at how the, the order that Jesus tells it to go. He says, go make a disciple, right? So I don't know if you're into uh, uh, baking, Jordy, but have you ever made a cake? Um, oh, yeah, actually, you know, I used to bake with my mom a lot when I was young. Great, man. That's, that's cool. Um, so would you say there's a difference between making a cake and buying a cake or getting a cake? Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. You know, Jordy, I, I can totally relate. You know, I, I, made, I made one cake in my life. Right, it was four years ago. It was for Rob Jenkins. I don't know why I did it. I made it for his birthday. I uh, was in San Francisco, but uh, uh, I just—it was on my heart. I'm like, I'm gonna make this guy a cake. And man, Jordy, I, I made this guy a cake, and it took me like five hours. Right, I'm not a baker, and it took me like all day. I, I made like the batter. I made, I made, I, I put everything together. I had to go to the store. I bought way too much stuff, spent like fifty bucks on this stuff, and I, I made a cake. But Jordy, here's something you gotta understand. There's a difference, major difference, between making something and buying something. And here Jesus says, hey, we need, you need to make, make a disciple, right? To be made into something, it's not just a decision, right? Because in the same way, the term disciple, what a disciple is, is a, a disciple is a student. So, Jordy, here, you're, you're a student here at Sac State, right? So what did it look like to become a student? Could you just walk into class and then start taking classes? Oh, no, no, I, I had to apply, applied last year. And uh, um, I had to pay a fee for like $75 for an application fee. And then I paid this for tuition and I had to send in my transcripts. Yeah, absolutely, because to become a student, there's a process to it. Jesus is the same way. He wants you to be made into a disciple. But it's not just an intellectual decision, right? There, there actually is activity that needs to happen. And here, Jesus says, I want all people to become disciples. Now, let's see what, that, this is what Jesus' will is, right? But let's, let's make sure that it, this checks out with what God's will is. Because even though he's, he's claiming to be God here, I just want to make, make sure that we're both on the same page. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Come on, Christian. Come on, let's go, Christian. This is great. And here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and uh, I'm going to have Chris read this one. And uh, Chris, you want to read this? Okay, thanks, man. You're the best. This, you also want to read verses uh, 3 and 4 here? All right, go ahead. So this is good. And pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so here, here for Timothy, it tells us what God's will is. What does it say that God's will is? Oh, he, he wants all men to be saved. Absolutely. And 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 here. He tells us God wants all men to be saved. And here, and sometimes what I'll do is I'll make like a box, right? I'll be like, Jesus equals God. Jesus wants all people to be disciples. God wants all people to be saved. And it's, it's just like, it's all equal to each other, right? So there's, there's no disconnect between disciple, saved, with God, against God. It, 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 it's all one, right? It's all one. Jesus wants all people, all nations to be disciples. Why? Because he, it's cool. No, it's because that's what it means to be saved, right? But, but Jordy, I want to show you a scripture that shows that only disciples were baptized, right? Let's go to uh, John chapter 4. Let's go to John chapter 4 because I know for myself, Jordy, I was baptized when I was, when I was 8 years old. Were you baptized when you were younger? Oh, yeah, I was baptized uh, when I was a baby. Okay. Yeah. It's very common, man. Very common. The majority of people who get baptized, they do it when they're, when they're young, right? When they're, they're either babies or when they're young kids, but let's look at the scripture here, Jordy. And here in John chapter four, and uh, we're going to have Matthew read this one. 
And Matthew, you want to read verses uh, uh, 1 and 2? All right. It says, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So let's stop right there. So let's look, look, look back at this, Jordy. So what was happening here? <clears throat> Um, let's see. It says, oh, the Pharisees heard Jesus was baptizing disciples, right? Okay. So they, it says he heard that Jesus was baptizing, but who was actually doing the baptizing of the disciples? Look at verse two. It says, although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So here we see the, the biblical principle in Jesus's ministry that only disciples were baptized right? Only disciples were baptized. And to be a disciple, Jordy, to be made into a disciple, do you think that's something you, a decision you can make when you're three years old, five years old, seven years old? Uh, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I can really understand the Bible when I was uh, seven. I mean, I can, yeah, we, we, you can't make a, a life altering decision when you're seven years old like that. Absolutely. When you're one year old, when you're two years old, so how do you think that infant baptism fits into uh, biblical baptism? Do you think there's a connection there? Uh, I mean, I can't see it. Absolutely. It's not, there's, there's no connection, right? There, there, there's no connection. Biblically, the only people who get baptized are disciples of Jesus Christ. But, but here we, we, we're, we're thinking about it. We're talking about it like disciple, 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 disciple. But here's the thing here that a lot of us don't even understand. I haven't even really heard the word disciple, right? Um, but here Jesus is very adamant that we need to make disciples, right? Everybody needs to become a disciple. And the last thing I want to point out here in John 4 is he, he mentions John. Did you, did you notice that, Jordy, in verse uh, 1? It says they're baptizing more people than, more disciples than John. Do you know which John this is? Um, I mean, it's got to be John the Baptist, right? Yeah, it's John the Baptist. This was Jesus's cousin. And his name was, his namesake was John the Baptist. Why do you think his name was the Baptist? Do you think it's because he didn't baptize very many people? No, because he baptized a lot of people, right? So how is it that the disciples were baptizing more than the dude whose name was the Baptist? How, did, how does that, because none of the disciples, none of the apostles' names were called the Baptist, right? So how is it that they were able to baptize more than this one superstar? Uh, man, that's, I mean, that's your question. Hey, yeah, right? It's, it's something we got to think about. And here, Jordy, I want to show you a little, uh, uh, little table here to give you, give you a little bit of an understanding of Jesus' ministry. And I think this is really going to help you out. And let's check this out, Jordy. So, so Jordy, let's check, let's check this out. Obviously, typically I'll write this out, but if it's over Zoom, I'll use this. So, Jordy, <clears throat> let's say uh, uh, you got a Jordy, you have a favorite uh, uh, soccer team. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I just love soccer. Who's your favorite player? Uh, mm, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Awesome. Yeah, me, mine too. Um, yeah, he's, a, he's, he's really good. Um, so, Let's, okay, let's, so let's look at this here. <clears throat> let's say that uh, we're going to put Cristiano Ronaldo in the place of this preacher, right? So he's what? He's like 34, 35, getting a little older for a professional soccer player. Let's say like next year he decides to retire, right? And he's like, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm over soccer. I'm ready to serve God. I, I, I'm tired of the fame. I'm tired. I just want to serve God. I want to I wanna make an impact, right? So let's say Cristiano Ronaldo starts a church over there in Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, after one year, Cristiano gets 365 members at his church. Right, Jordy? I mean, that's a pretty decent sized church, Jordy, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd say, I'd say so. Yeah, okay, so Jordy, let's just, just for, for argument's sake here, let's say that um, well, at the same moment Cristiano Ronaldo decides to start a church, you to start, you decide, you want to be a disciple, right? So you become a disciple, you get baptized as a disciple. And after one year, 
right? So we're just going to be, we're just going to say Cristiano averages one new member a day, right? We're just going to give him one new member a day, right? After one year, he's going to have 365. We're, we're just going to give you, we're going to be like, hey, you know what, Jordy, you're awesome. Jordy, I think you're an incredible guy. You don't have quite, but you don't have quite the clout or the recognition of Cristiano Ronaldo. Would you agree? <sighs> yeah, I mean, not yet, at least. <laughs> I like that heart, man. You're going to do great things. Um, ambitious, I like that. But so, but for right now, Jordy, let's 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 just say that after one year, you go out and you're, you're not just telling people, "Hey, believe, believe, believe." You're actually calling people, "Hey, you need to be a disciple, right? You you need to you need to commit yourself to be a disciple, to be fully committed, uh, to make more disciples." That's what the Great Commission said. And after one year, you get one person to buy in. You get one person to buy into the gospel. Right after one year, you just got two people, right? So I mean, you, you're looking across. I mean, if uh, as far as like church size, I mean, you're looking across the pond there, Cristiano and in, in uh, Portugal, and it's a little a little discouraging, right? But let's say let's just let's jump forward to year two, right? In year two, let's say Cristiano continues to get one new member a day, and then over here, you and your 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 uh, uh, you and Corey who you baptized, made him a disciple, you two just go get two more guys, right? You guys get like Dustin here and um, you get uh, Newton here. And so you, after two years, you've got four disciples, right? So you're growing. I mean, you're doubling, but still, I mean, you still got over 700 or less than Cristiano's, right? Let's go fast forward to year three. So how many, how many uh, uh, disciples do you think there's going to be in year three? Uh, six. All right, well, let's look at it again, right? So here, this is a principle that each disciple, each year makes one disciple. It's pretty conservative, right? Just one disciple every year. After three years, right? After Obviously, after three years, you're going to just have over a thousand for Cristiano's church because he's still averaging one member a day. After three years, you're going to have eight, Right. And so, man, this is this could be after three years, this could be a little discouraging. I mean, you know, Cristiano is over here meeting at a, you know, like a, a huge complex and you're meeting at a Starbucks still, you know, getting pumpkin spice lattes for the whole church every Sunday. And uh, man, it's a little you guys just have to pull two tables together and you have enough seating for the whole church. But but here's the thing, Jordy. If you keep on this path that. Each disciple, each year makes one more disciple. And you do this every single year, right? And you do it year after year after year. Fast forward to year 13. Let's check this out. Boom. So here we see after 13 years, there's more disciples then there are members of Cristiano Ronaldo's church. Jordy, how is that possible? Oh man, wow, that's crazy. I mean, I mean, I, I guess like, I mean, the disciples, each one of them is working, right? Yeah, Jordy, absolutely. Each disciple is working. On the other side, you just have one guy doing all the work, right? Let's, Jordy, let's fast forward 20 more years, Jordy. I wanna, I wanna blow your mind a little bit here. You fast forward 20 more years. Check this out. In 33 years, Cristiano Ronaldo's church is going to have 12,000 people. But check this out. In 33 years, if each disciple just made one more disciple, you're going to evangelize the whole world. Now, Jordy, does this mean that after 33 years that the whole world is going to be 100% disciples? No. I mean, there's a little less than 8 billion people in the world right now. There's not even 10 billion people. But what, it, what this shows us is that Jesus' method actually works of disciples making disciples making disciples. Now, here's the, 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 sobering, the sobering reality, right, Jordy, is that in Cristiano Ronaldo's church, do you think those people are disciples? Um... I mean, can they be? I don't, I don't know. Jordy, I mean, here's the thing, Jordy. What is it? What do disciples do? Oh, they make more disciples. 
Yeah, absolutely, Jordy. Disciples make more disciples. And here, Jordy, not one of these people made one disciple. The scary thing about that, though, that means that Cristiano Ronaldo isn't a disciple. Because, because a disciple, what does Jesus say to do? He says to make more disciples, right? That's like me calling myself a mechanic, but I've never opened the hood of a car, right? It's like, oh, well, I mean, I know about cars. I've read about cars. I used to play uh, video games. I had like a, a, a setup in my house with like, you know, like, a, a, um, you know, like with a steering wheel and a gas pedal is like in my living room. Does that make me a can mechanic? No. All right. So just because somebody's talking about it doesn't make them a disciple, right? You actually need to be doing the work. And we see here that when we do do the work, we can have a true impact on the world. But Jordy, I, you know, we, we, we were talking a lot about disciples here, disciple, disciple, disciple. The question is, what is a disciple? Right? I mean, like a lot of people, like for the most of us, we grow up and what's the word we hear? We hear, we hear the word Christian, right? The word Christian. And so, um, Jordy, let, let me give you, give you a, a chance here to uh, answer a couple of questions. If you were to define the word Christian, what would it be? Um, word Christian, I'd say somebody who believes in God. Totally. I, 100%. I, I agree. A Christian is somebody who believes in God. All right. The next question then would be what defines a disciple? Right. And so this is usually I'll write this out on a uh, I'll write this out on a uh, like a piece of paper here. I'll say Christian and then disciple. And I, I like to put Christian on the bottom. Right. I'll say Christian and then you know, the definitions will change, but it's always, you know, something like that. And then I'll say, all right, now, Jordy, what's a disciple? If you were to define, again, Jordy, this is just based off your understanding of it. But how would you define a disciple? Oh, I mean, it's somebody who's going out and making more. It's somebody who's, it's somebody who's actually like super evangelistic. Yeah, absolutely. It's somebody who's making more. It's somebody who's offensive about their Christianity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say, I'll say, awesome, Jordy. And, you know, it, it's interesting because um, even though usually we, we don't uh, see the talk to hear the word disciple today, the two words actually come together in the Bible, right? It's pretty cool. Let's check this out. Let's go to Acts chapter 11. Let's go to Acts chapter 11. Let's go, bro. Come on, Christian. And in Acts chapter 11. And uh, Jordy, you want to go ahead and read this one? Let's go, Christian. All right, Jordy, you want to read verses 25 and 26? Um, yeah, for sure. Okay, go ahead, man. All right, it says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And so, Jordy, check this out. Check this out. We see the word Christian and the word disciple come together in the Bible. What does it say their connection is? Um, well, I mean, I saw the words come together here in verse 26. Um, yeah, go, re go ahead and read that, that last sentence there. Okay, it says the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Um, so what's the connection? Uh, I mean, it, it looks like they're the same thing, right? Absolutely. Jordy, the word Christian was a nickname for the disciples. Jordy, do you have a nickname? Uh, yeah, I mean, my friends call me J-Money. All right, J Money. So if, if I call if somebody calls you J Money and your mom calls you Jordy, are they talking to two different people? Uh no. I mean I'm J Money, whether my mom's talking to me or my friends are talking to me. Absolutely, man. You're the same person no matter who's talking, no matter what nickname they call you, they're talking to the same person. In the same way, the word Christian and disciple 
most people, you know, Jordy, I, I, I like, I, I appreciate your answer and I appreciate you being honest here. And it's interesting, Jordy, because I've studied the Bible with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And you want to know what? Just about 90% of them believe the word disciple is a higher calling. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of nuts. Yeah, Jordy. And here's, here's, a, here's another thing. Check this out. No, I mean, you could go to a church just about anywhere, anywhere in the world, right? I mean, a, a Christian church that's like 100% like, that believes in God. And uh, you, could just, you could go up to uh, about all of them, go up to most people in church, and they say, hey, you know, what, what uh, do I need to be saved? What do I need to be? What, what, do, I, who do, I, what do I need to be? They'll be like, oh, I just need to be a Christian, right? You need to be a Christian to be, the sa to be saved. And nobody's really going to argue that. Right, nobody who's like uh, has a faith. Not many people who have some sort of faith in God are going to argue that. But here's here's the thing, Jordy, is that now after looking at the scripture, we can add something to this. We can add something to this equation, and check this out. Disciple. equals Christian, equals saved. Why, why can we do that? Because it, it's a synonym, right? The word Christian, the word disciple, you could exchange them. Or it's like Jordy and J money. You could switch, you could switch them. You're, there is always going to be the same person, right? So do you think, Jordy, do you think you can be one of these? Like, could I be a, a could I like pick and choose what I want to be? Could I be like a Christian and be saved and then not be a disciple? No, I can't. It, it, it's all got to be connected. It's all got to be connected, right? So if I want to be saved, which God wants, God says, come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. And Jesus wants all people to be disciples. It's, it, 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 it's all connected, Jordy. And, but most people, you know, just, just know the word Christian. And here's something crazy, Jordy. Let me ask you a question. Guess how many times the word Christian is in the Bible? Go, go out on a limb here. I think the highest number I've ever heard was 1 million. Um, uh, but my, uh, probably, I mean, probably a lot, right? I mean, probably like, um, like 100? Three times. Three times. Jordy, guess how many times the word disciples in there? Uh, probably a lot more than that. Maybe like 100? Jordy, the word disciples in there almost three times hundred times almost 300 and here here's one of the 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 the, the sentences the the verses where the word christian is used there's only two other ones in the whole bible where the word christian is there so jordy which word do you think we should study out to figure out what a true christian or a true disciple is should we study out the word christian or should we study out the word disciple uh disciple why you're, you're right why because we're going to get way more material on what it really means to be saved right so jordy what we're going to do here we're going to look at a few scriptures and see what what the calling of a true christian is what does it really mean right what does it really mean you could ask 10 different people today you'll get 10 different answers let's look at the bible what does the bible say about being a true disciple. Let's go here to Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one. Come on, Christian. Let's go, bro. Let's go, bro. Let's go. Let's go, Christian. Let's go, Christian. Mark chapter one. And we'll pick it up here, and Jordy, I'll read this one. In Mark chapter one, verse 16. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. And check this out, Jordy. It says, the calling of the first disciples. Isn't that pretty cool? These are the first Christians ever in the world. These are the first followers of Christ. And let's check this out. Let's read verse, sorry, pick it up in verse 16. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. 
for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once, they left their nets and followed him. When he got a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And Jordy, here it is, the calling of the first disciples, right? And Jordy, why do you think that this passage is in the Bible? Why do you think that um, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit felt it necessary to put this in here? Uh, I mean, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool story. Yeah. And, and what does it do? It, it gives us a blueprint. It gives us a blueprint of what the call would be if we want to be true disciples of Jesus. And let's look at it. Let's look at the blueprint here. Here, Jesus goes, is walking beside the sea. And now they knew who Jesus was. This wasn't the first time they'd met him. They weren't just kind of on a whim, like, I hate my job. I want to get out of here. They knew they were, these guys knew who Jesus was. They knew what he was about to an extent, right? I mean, I'm, 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 I know that all their faith wasn't all the way there. Uh, but uh, they, they, had, they had an understanding of who Jesus was, what his message was. And so here, Jesus is by side the Sea of Galilee. He calls to him. He says, hey, come follow me. And look what he, look what he says here, Jordy. He says, come follow me in verse 17, and I will make you fishers of men. Right? What's, what's, what's interesting about Jesus, man, he was a, he was a cool dude. Right, he sees these guys fishing for fish. He says, "Hey, you guys are fishing for fish. Forget, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you out to fish for men." And he drops the mic, and they're like, "Oh!" And they drop their nets and they follow him. Right, but but here's the here's the thing we gotta understand, Jordy. These guys weren't just on like a, a fishing expedition. Right, these guys weren't just kind of out with their buddies just fishing for the day. This was their livelihood. Jordy, this was, this was their life. The, the Jewish system, the, and during the time period in the first century, it was a caste system. And what that meant is that where, whatever you grew up in, that's where you were going to be the rest of your life. So if you grew up and your dad was a, was a carpenter, you were going to be a carpenter. You grew up, and by the time you're six years old, you know what you're going to be doing the rest of your life. Right? And so they grew up, their fathers were fishermen. Their grandfathers would have been fishermen. It, it would have been a family lineage passed down. And here's, the, here's these guys. And that they're out not only living out their career, but these guys, as it says, uh, James, and, James and John, they were with their dad. It was a family business. So these guys weren't, it was, this wasn't like a job they found on a LinkedIn or this wasn't like uh, something they just picked up part-time. This was their life. And Jesus calls them. And Jordy, how, how does it say that they reacted? Um, it says at once they left their nets. Absolutely, at once. How quick is that? Uh, immediately. Absolutely. And so what's the blueprint it gives us? That how quickly should we follow Jesus when he calls us? Immediately. Immediately, Jordy. Is this something that you want to do? Yeah, yeah, man. I've I've always wanted to live for Jesus. I've always I've always wanted to, um, I've always wanted to do, to do God's will for my life. Jordy, Jordy, that's awesome, man. It's awesome. It's awesome that you want to do that. But I gotta ask you a question, Jordy. Up until this point in your life, what has been your purpose? Um, maybe like uh, uh I don't know. Honestly, man, I, I'm not. I'm not sure, Jordy. You know what? Yeah, I, I appreciate you being honest, because you know what? You know what the reality is. That the majority of people go through their life, and they they never they never have their true purpose. You want to know why that is? And they go through life, and they you know what the number one demographic of suicide is, Jordy? It's middle aged men. It's middle aged men. You think it might be like high schoolers or teenagers or people who are going through. But no, it, it's people who've seen the world, who've done the career, that had the jobs, tried out the world, had a family, and you get to be 
40, 50, 60 years old. And you say, man, there's no purpose in this. And they, they kill themselves. They kill themselves. And Jordy, the majority of people are going through their life right now with no purpose. With no purpose. Why is that? Because God's calling not only these guys here in Mark 1. God's calling all people to become fishers of men. So here, Jordy, what would God call your purpose to be? Oh, make disciples, right? Fish, fish for men. Absolutely, Jordy. God wants your purpose to be make disciples. And, you know, Jordy, it's interesting, you know, because, um, you know, we have, we have a lot of people in our church, you know, and we have an international church. And, you know, there's a lot of people with a lot of different jobs, right? A lot of different careers. But something we got to understand, Jordy, there's a difference between a career and a purpose. So we have people who are teachers, doctors, nurses, Uber drivers, you know, um, people who uh, um, work at Target, people who are, are managers, people, people have, in, in every walk of life. But your career as, as, as a true Christian isn't your job. Uh, your, 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 per, your, career, or your career is not your purpose. It's your job. It's not your purpose. No matter what career you go into, Jordy, your purpose is going to be to make disciples. So if you're, if you're a doctor, right, and, and you, 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 have, you have other doctors you're working with, you work at a hospital, you even have patients, your, your, your purpose isn't to actually heal the people. Your purpose is to share the gospel with them in the hopes that they, they may surrender their lives to God as well and become true disciples. Because here's the thing, Jordy, you could come up with the cure to cancer and just sell, send a, a lot of cancer-free people to hell. That's the reality of it, Jordy. That's the reality of it. That at the end of the day, the only thing God cares about and his deepest concern for the world is that they come to a knowledge of the truth and become true disciples. And Jordy, I, I, I'm fired up that, that you want to do that and that you want that to make God's purpose your purpose. But I, I want to show you a few more scriptures to show you what that's going to look like. Right? I don't just kind of want to throw you in blind and say, hey, now go do it. I want to give you a little bit of an understanding of what that's going to look like. Let's go here to Luke chapter 9. Let's go to Luke chapter 9. Come on, Christian. Let's go, bro. Let's go, bro. Go. Luke chapter 9, and we're going to pick it up here in verse 23. It says, then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? And Jordy, looking at this passage here, Jesus, Jesus is turning, he's talking to a group of people. And who does it say that he's addressing here? Look at verse 23. Uh, it says to them all, if anyone, all right, so who does anyone include? Everyone. So everyone who, who, who would have a desire to be a disciple, this is what God would call them to do. He says, it, it says, if anyone would come after me, he must, he must, he, he doesn't, he doesn't say, I hope. I say, if anybody would come after me, I hope that they, they would deny themselves, right? Because Jordi, people have this understanding of Jesus this misconception that he's just asking for like a, a little nib of your, of the, the crumbs off your plate. And he just wants like a, a, like 10 seconds of your day. And then he just wants a couple minutes. The reality of, is Jordy is that Jesus doesn't need our acceptance, right? Jesus is a King, right? Jesus is a King. He has every right to ask for everything. And that's why he, he feels comfortable here. He says, Hey, if you want to follow me, the front door of that, 
the front door of being a true disciple is denying yourself every day. I mean, it, what it really boils down to it, Jordan, you don't know, you want to know what Christianity is? It's radical self-denial. It's self-denial in the highest degree. Because what you're doing, you're, you're living, you're not living for yourself. You're living for your whole life for somebody else. You're living your life for Jesus. And that's why he says here, he says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. He's saying, if you want to save your life, if you want to go to heaven, you wonder what you're going to do? You're going to let go of your life. You're going to let go of the things that you have in your life that you just have to do. I have to have this job. I have to make this much money. I have to move here at this point. I have, I have, I have to say, you know what? You got to let go. You got to let go. You got to let, you got to relinquish control of your life. You got to lose it. And if you lose it, you'll gain it for eternal life. But he says, you know what? You have the option. What's the option? The other option, he says, he says, <clears throat> Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. So you lose your life for God, you'll save it for eternal life. The other thing you can do is you can save your life here. You, you, you can grab on to your, every, every little pleasure you want, every little hope you want, every desire you have for your life. And you know what? You have every right to do so. You have every right to do so. You can live your life exactly how you want. You're just not going to go to heaven. You're going to go to hell, right? And Jesus says, if you want to go to heaven, you want to be a, a true Christian, you've got to deny yourself every day. You know, I'm coming up on our, our Devin and I's one-year anniversary, right? No, and and what that, that's still death that's to us part right there, all right? Death to us part. That, that means that it doesn't matter how I'm feeling, right? I could, I could wake up tomorrow. We could get into an argument. I could go out, I could drive, drive, I could drive and drive and drive and I could drive to another state, right? I could just leave my phone here. And, but at the end of the day, I'm married. So I, I could go to another state and a, a girl could help me at a counter or something at a restaurant. And at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, hey, nice to meet you, but you know what? I'm married. I could have an argument, I could have a fight, but it, it, at the end of the day, I, I made a commitment. No matter how she's treating me, no matter how I'm treating her, which is usually pretty good, right? Um, no matter how I'm treating her, that it, I, I, no matter what my feelings are, that I made the decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come home every night. I'm going to be her husband until I die. Until the day that I die, I'm committed. You know, they have those T-shirts. They have those T-shirts that has like a bride and groom on top of a cake. And it says game over right? Because there, there's a reality of it. It's like, hey, the games are over, buddy. All right? It's like, from now on, you're denying yourself. And in the same way, ironically, right? Not ironically, I think God appointed it, but God calls the church the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. In the same way you deny yourself in a physical marriage, it's like, I'm committed no matter where, where life takes me. It's the same way in a marriage with Jesus, that no matter where life takes us, we're going to be totally committed every single day, right? And, and Jordy, let's, let's look at one more, let's look at a couple more scriptures here before we close out. Let's go to Luke chapter 9, later in Luke chapter 9, verse 57. Come on, Christian, this is awesome. Come on, Christian. Let's go, bro. Let's go. Luke chapter 9. And so sometimes I'll look at this one. But typically what I do now, <clears throat> I'll look at it the next one we're going to look at, look at after this. But this is one that's good to look at. So I'm going to share it right here, this for us. Um, so, Jordy, let's look at this one here. And we're going to have Corey read again. Um, <clears throat> and, Jordy, right here before verse 57, what, what's the title here? <clears throat> What's the title? Uh, the cost of following Jesus, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of, what's interesting? The Bible tells us here, following Jesus is actually going to cost you. Most people think it's a free ride, right? It's like, hey, I don't, 
I, I, I just, I want it. So he's going to give it to me. It's like, no, it, it, it's actually going to cost you. Even if you want it, right. Even if you, if, even if you want it, it, it's not just, it's not just something that you're going to get just from having an intellectual want of it. Right. I mean, I could go down to the uh, Mercedes Benz dealership, you know, and uh, look at, uh, you know, look at a $120,000 car. I maybe dress up really nice and, you know, kind of talk a big game and uh, say, yeah, you know, I could maybe like rent, I'll like rent like a Tesla or something for like 40 bucks for a couple hours. I could drive in and I could talk to him like, yeah, you know, guys, I'm looking at a car here and I think I want this one. I want this one right here. You know, I don't even want to, I don't even need to test drive it. I want to, let's go, let's, let's get it. Can I get it out today? I'm going to drive it out there. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Let's, let's get, let's get, run the paperwork here. And, you know, they sit down and uh, they, they get, they drop the forms, the, the financing. I'm like, okay, so, you know, I, I'm, I, I've never wanted something more than in my life. You know, I kind of tell them like, this is just such a special day. You know, I've, I've always wanted this and uh, man, I could get emotional, man. I'm just so grateful for you guys giving me this car. Like, yeah, man, I'm glad we could work with you, bro. And, and then I say, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's a uh, issue. I mean, I'm sure it's not because we haven't talked about, you know, I'm going to drive it off today, but I, I only have $87 in my checking account. Am I actually, I, and don't even, don't even get me started on the savings. I have less than that. Um, but uh, 80, but I mean, $87, I, 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 I'm going to have more money at some, some point, but is it, but it, it's, it's cool. Right. I mean, I'll just drive it off. I know you already said you want me to have it. It's a big deal for me. Is it cool if I drive it off the, the, the lot today? I mean, they're, what's going to happen? They're going to kick me out of their office before I even finish telling them how much I want it. Right. Why? Because it, it, it costs something. In the same way, it actually costs something to follow Jesus. Right. And we're going to really define exactly what that is over these next couple of scriptures. But here in Luke chapter nine, verse 57, it says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. All right. That's the first guy comes up to him and he says, hey, I want to follow you. But what was the cost he was unwilling to pay? He was unwilling to be homeless. What Jesus said, he's like, hey, I don't have a home. Birds have nests. Myself, I just go town to town. I sleep in the grass. Sometimes I'll sleep in a house and somebody will have me. But I mean, I don't, I don't have a home, man. And this is like, dang. There's no account of this guy following, right? The next guy, he said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, First, let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. This is Jesus. This is Jesus Christ. This is our Lord and Savior. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God. And he tells the guy to let the dead, he tells the guy about his dying father, right? He says, let the dead bury their own dead that's it does that seem pretty harsh jordy uh yeah i mean i never knew jesus said that and here's the thing he says let the dead bury their own dead so most scholars believe that this guy was uh his father was in the in the, in the end of his life right so is he gonna pass in the following days or he had just passed but the the, the ceremony and everything to uh like for the funeral would have been probably a, a few weeks uh, for this guy to, uh, and Jewish custom, the, the funeral, the mourning process. Um, so it would have been a little bit, a little bit of time. It would have been, would have been longer than, you know, a month or so. <clears throat> but, um, but Jesus responds, he says, let the dead bear their own. How, how would the dead bury the dead? Um, that's a good question. He's talking about the spiritually dead, Jordy. He's saying, you know what? The people back in your hometown, they're, they're spiritually dead. They're, they're not disciples. I don't, don't, don't waste your time. Jesus understood time was short. He understood it, it, that, that we never know what the next moment's going to bring. He knew he only had three years. He didn't have time to waste. And so he's like, hey, you know what? You're going to follow me. You're going to be a true disciple. 
You can't, you can't waste a month. You're, you're, it's a waste. What? Why? Because that one month you're just sitting there with your, with your father who's not open. A month you could be sharing the gospel. Is a month you could be preaching discipleship. Is a month you could be reaching out to people who really want it. Who really want a true relationship with God. But this is what Jesus called. He says, let the dead bear their own dead. Look at this next guy. This next guy is just kind of crazy here. It says in verse 61, still another. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jordy, how long does it say, take to say goodbye to your family? I mean, a couple of seconds, right? Yeah. Takes, hey, hey guys, see you later. I'm going to go follow Jesus. He's the man. He's the Messiah. Peace. Right, but how look, let's look at how Jesus responded. Verse 62 Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And so, Jordy, you know what a plow is? Uh, yeah, it's like a, a farming tool, right? Yeah, right. So, it's like you're, you're, you're plowing a field, right? What's going to happen if you look back? Right? Have you ever like drove through the drove through like a like a wine country or driven through where there's a lot of fields and you know how you see like the perfect lines of of crops and corn or um, whatever it may be? Is that kind of cool? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. You know how those are like perfect lines? What do you think would happen if you're you're plowing and you look back? What's it gonna do? It, it's gonna throw off the whole field. It, it's gonna it's gonna mess everything up. In the same way, Jesus here is like. Hey, once you start working the fields, working the fields for the harvest spiritually, and you look back to, to your old life, you look back to, to where you were, what you used to be. It's like, man, you're, you're not fit for service. You, you have to be all in. You have to be 100% in, man. And, and here's, here's the reality of it. Is that is? Do you think that Jesus couldn't spare thirty seconds for this guy to say bye to his family? No, I, th I think he could have. But here's here's the issue, Jordy. Look at what his heart was. In verse six twenty, he says, "I will follow you, Lord, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family." See, in the in this interaction, this guy's heart came out. That what was his number one priority in life? It was his family. He said, "Hey, Jesus, I'll follow you. Hey, but you know what? Number one is family." So I'm going to take care of that, but then I'll come follow you. Jesus understood, if, you, if I'm not number one, I, you're, you're not going to stay faithful, all right? Because it's going to get tough. It's going to get hard. Eventually, you're going to quit because I, I'm not number one in your life. He's like, you know what? Since it says I'm not number one, don't even start. Don't even start to follow me. Let's look at one more guy. Let's look at one more guy who also really wanted to be with God, really wanted to go to heaven but ended up walking away sad. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. Mark uh -huh. chapter 10. And here in Mark chapter 10, and we'll have Chris read this one again. He did a really good job last time. And uh, Mark chapter 10, here in verse 17, it says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. So this guy's running. He's sliding up to Jesus on his knees in front of probably thousands of people. And he, he humbly, right? Because it takes some humility to, to fall on your knees before another man, right? This, this guy does it. He falls on his knees before Jesus. He says, good teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Right, so this guy's a form of humility. He has a desire to follow God and wants to go to heaven. But let's see what happens. 18. Why do you call me good? Jesus said. All right, Jesus looks straight, straight through this guy. He's trying to butter him up. He's like, come on, man. Who do you think you are? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. So here Jesus rattles off the commandments. So look how he responds. He says, verse 20, teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And Jesus doesn't call him a liar. So this guy was a righteous dude. 
this guy was a righteous man, right? This, this, this guy, he held to the standard of the old covenant. And let's continue. Let's continue. Verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him, right? Jesus loves everybody. There's nobody on this earth. There's no human being that Jesus doesn't love. All right, Jesus looks at him and he, he loves him. His love is unconditional, but his acceptance is conditional. As we see here, one thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Right? So here, what does Jesus say? He says, one thing you lack, but he tells him to do two things. Right? He says, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, then come follow me. And isn't it interesting in a time today where people, most people believe that the, the, the world of Christianity teaches, hey, you just got to do one thing. Just believe. Just believe that Jesus is God. This guy was unwilling to do one thing. And Jesus says it's going to keep him out of heaven. Right? Far removed from Christianity we see today. And Jesus says, hey, one thing you like, go sell everything you have. What was the issue? It, it was that Jesus saw this guy's heart. And he saw that money was number one. His possessions, his wealth was the number one thing in his heart. So he, he tested him. He said, Hey, go sell everything you have. Then come follow me. How does he respond? Verse 22. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jordy, this is, this is the sad reality. You know, most people are going to walk away sad. Most people are going to walk away sad. Why? Why? Because at the end of the day, most people have, have other things in their life that they it fundamentally have above God. But Jordy, it's so awesome to be studying the Bible with you as a man who really wants to put God first. But let's, Jordy, let, let's close out here. Let's go to Luke chapter 14. Let's go to Luke 14. Let, let's really tie this together. Luke chapter 14. Come on, Christian. Come on, Christian. Let's go, bro. In Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So, Jordy, just check this out. It starts off in verse 25. He says, large crowds traveling with Jesus. This represents the religious world today, right? Everybody wants to be on the Jesus bandwagon, right? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is awesome. Jesus is my buddy, right? Jesus takes naps. You know, it's awesome, man. He's cool. He's a cool dude. He wears Toms. He wears ripped up jeans. He relates to me. He understands me. That's the, the, the Christianity, right? That most people see. And, and it's, this is, it represents the large crowds, right? The large crowds of the religious world. And Jesus turns to him. He, he doesn't want, he, because at this point, Jesus is a celebrity, right? And he's like, you know, I, I don't want you guys just following me for the thrill. I, I, he's like, and so what he does here, he, he distills. Whenever there's a big crowd following Jesus, one of what he does, he never turns around and says, thanks for coming. He always says, hey, if you really want to be here, you got to repent. And he really boils it down to the reality of the situation. And he says here in verse 26, if anyone comes to me, does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, even his own life, you can't be my disciple. Jordy, here, Jesus says, if you don't hate your family, you can't be a disciple. This is, these are Jesus' words. These aren't my words. I probably wouldn't have said it. I probably wouldn't have said this, you know. But here, Jesus does. He says, if you don't hate your family, 
you can't be a disciple. What do you think he means by that, Jordy? Man, I, I don't know. Like, I never think of Jesus and hating people, like, especially your family. Yeah, absolutely, Jordy. And, you know, the word hate here, he doesn't mean actually hates, like burn, burning rage, right? He, he's, when he says hate, he's, if you look at it, uh, the, other, the other gospels, you'll see he says, he says, whoever loves their family, whoever doesn't love their family less than me is not worthy of me. And what he's saying is that if you don't have, he says, this, this is your priorities. These are your priorities, Jordy. So you got, up until this point, you got yourself, right? Your, your own wants, your own desires. You got your friends. You got like your family, maybe, maybe like right even with you. You got your hobbies. You got, um, you know, you got your job. Um, you got, uh, uh, you got school, you know, you got, uh, uh, and then you got, you know, I, I, some other, some other commitments you got down here. And then, and then it, it fundamentally, fundamentally, Jordy, up to this point, where's God been? He's, he's been about right here, right? You know, when he's convenient, you will go to church and you hop into a Bible study. But fundamentally, Jesus has been to the bottom of your priority list. What Jesus is calling you to do here, what he's calling the crowd to do, he's saying, you got to take me here and boom, put me so far above all of your other priorities that that separation feels like hate. That the separation, that there's, there's such a separation between your commitment to Jesus and everything else. There's a feeling of, of hate, of not being wanted. You know, there's a, there's a discontentment with the, the, the other people, with the people and the relationships in your life when they see you really prioritize Jesus. And Jordy, this is something I've experienced. You know, I became a disciple in May of 2016. And you know what? I, I studied the Bible, made Jesus Lord, got baptized on May 15th as a disciple. And you want to know what? My family didn't really understand. You know, every year my family did at a, at a, as a one-week camping trip. And Jordy, I, uh, they, my, my uh, uh, dad called me. He said, hey, so we got a one-week camping trip coming up here. And uh, we got a trip coming up. So it's going to be Thursday through Tuesday um, this summer. And I said, awesome. You know, Dad, I'm going to come up Thursday. I'm going to head back Saturday. I'm going to head back Saturday for a church on Sunday. He said, oh, we'll, we'll do something up here on Sunday. You know, we'll have a little service. And uh, I said, no, I'm going to head back Saturday. At this point, I, granted, I'm, I'm 22 years old at this point. I said, I'm, I'm going to head back Saturday. He said, no, you know, no. He said, stay up, here. stay up here for the week. It's a family trip. And I said, I'm going back Saturday. I said, I'm sorry. That's, that's what's, what, what it's going to be. And my, my dad blew up. He, he was, I, I was taken aback. He was screaming at me. He said, he said, you're disrespecting me. I feel dishonored right now. And he's like, it's the, in, in the 10 commandments, you got to honor your mother and father. And here's the thing. Absolutely. We got to love, we got to honor our parents. We got to honor our family, but not at the expense of sacrificing our commitment to Jesus. And at that time, for the first time in my life, I put Jesus over my family and they felt it and they felt it and as a true disciple when you really start to put god first in a practical sense not just talking about it your family and your friends are going to see it and jesus says here you got to be willing to count that cost he continues verse 27 anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple here he says he says it's different than the, the last scripture looked at that said in luke this in Luke 9 that said, carry your cross daily. This is talking about carrying your physical cross. He's talking about a physical death. And we, we know he's talking about a physical death because the majority of the apostles were killed for their testimony. Outside of Judas, who hanged himself, and John the Baptist, who was boiled alive but survived and exiled to the island of Patmos, the other, all of the rest of them were killed. For their testimony. So when Jesus said, hey, you guys got to be one to carry your cross. They understood the reality of the situation. They, they were going to have to physically be willing to die for this. You got to believe that from the large crowds who started coming, at this point, they started to simmer down. 
right? He continues verse 28. He doesn't just stop there. He doesn't say, all right, guys, now we got our group. He keeps going. He keeps distilling it. Verse 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. And so here it's connecting your, your Christian walk with building a tower. And it says, if you're going to build a tower, what are you going to do? You're going to sit down and count the cost. Why is that, Jordy? Why, why would you count the cost before you started to build something? Uh, I mean, I don't, I've never done construction or anything. So, well, think about it, Jordy. If I'm going to build a house, or let's say I own a construction company, and I'm going to put build a house, so we're, we're going to put our, our company name out front. We're going to put big stakes in the front yard to, to uh, display the, the, the company, the brand. What I'm doing that, when, when I take upon the responsibility of building a house, then that then becomes identified with me. And what I mean by that and how that relates to this is Jesus says, if, if you're going to become a disciple and you're going to follow me, count the cost. Understand that this is, this is a lifelong commitment. He says, see if you have enough money to complete it. Why? Because if I start building a house, put the stakes, put a huge sign in the front yard, that's like, this is my company. We're working on the house. We're building this house. And we get halfway through and then decide, oh, shoot, we don't have enough money. And we, 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 we pack up all our stuff. And then there's just a half-finished house in a neighborhood. Everybody who's going to be driving by, the neighbors, the people in the like, hey, that was, that was the house Jordy's, Jordy's company was building. <laughs> they, they only got halfway. They didn't have enough money to finish it. They didn't, they didn't count the cost before they started everybody's going to ridicule you. In the same way, if you become a true disciple, you in terms of Christian say, hey, Jesus is Lord. I, I, I love God. Jesus, and you, and you start you invite people to Bible studies or invite people to church. Or you're praying. You're waking up early. You're, you're getting time. You're reading your Bible. And, 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 and everybody, you, you post on Facebook scriptures and stuff you're, with the church you're doing. And then six months later, you're back smoking weed, drinking, Trying to trying to get with girls and all this stuff. What's gonna people are gonna ridicule you, man? People are gonna say, Jordy, man, I knew this guy was a joke. All right, this guy's never stuck with anything in his life. He's he he did this Christian God. I knew God wasn't real. All right, this guy. I mean, I was this guy so much zeal. I thought something might be be going on there, but I mean, I just saw it just sort of a phase. And this guy's not for real. God's not for real. And, and what, so here, here's what Jesus is calling you to do. He's like, if you don't have the, the conviction, the character to see this through the rest of your life, don't even start. God would rather have you never become a true disciple. Never. He would rather have you never get baptized as a disciple, never be a disciple, never do anything with the Bible, never even open your Bible. Don't, don't, don't do it. If you're going to start it and then stop. Why? Because it, 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 it smears his name. It's the reason why people look down on Christianity today. Why? Because there's millions and millions and millions of people who say, I am a Christian. And then they go out and they live like the world. One of the number one words people think of when they think of Christians, hypocrites. Hypocrites, people, they, they, people who, who you, there's so many memes, Reddit groups, chat groups and just deep-seated hate and disdain in people's hearts because of people in their life or people they've seen who've claimed Christianity but have walked a completely different path. And Jesus understood this was going to happen. He says, you know what? I don't even want you to start. Don't, don't tarnish my name. If you're going to be in this, you got to be in this for the long haul. Jordy, do you want to be in this for the long haul? Yeah, man, I got to. I got to. I, I, that's a good answer, Jordy. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. Let's keep going here. Let's close out in, uh, here in verse 31. It says, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to, the oppose, to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, 
He will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Here, Jordy, Jesus paints a picture for us. All right, let me paint a picture for you here. So here, Jesus paints a picture. And Jordy, have you ever seen the movie uh, 300? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love that movie. Okay, cool, man. Have you ever about like Braveheart or uh, no, no. Yeah, I didn't probably know. You're too old for you. Um, but, you know, in the movie 300, right, you know how they, uh, uh, they, they sort of have a battle on the cliff, right? And they're, they're, they're sort of like, they're kind of like pushing them to the cliff and they have the, all these battles on the cliff so that they don't have to take on the full army at once. But then eventually what happens, right? Eventually what happens, what happens is called plane warfare which was how things were done in the first century, right? It wasn't like today where, um, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, people like, it, there's like guerrilla warfare and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the case back then. You'd get one army here, you get one army here with just swords, daggers, and, 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 and some armor on you and you just charge at each other, right? It was, it was very primitive. And Jordy, what, would, what, what the, the picture that Jesus paints here is that there's, an, there's two armies. Would you see, do you, you catch the size of the two armies? Uh, yeah, it looks like 10,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what's the other one? Uh, 20,000, right? Yeah, 20,000. All right, so here, this is the picture he paints. He says, if you are the army of, if you're the king of the army of 10,000, right? He's talking to the you, right? The you, the army of 10,000. He said, those of you are, if you're, you're a commander of an army of 10,000 people and you see coming, somebody coming against you with 20,000, you see somebody against you with, coming against you with 20,000 troops, what does it say you're going to do, Jordy? Um, it says here you're going to send out a delegation. Yeah, it says you're going to send out a delegation while the other is still a long way off. Why is that? Because if you wait too long, Jordy, what's going to happen? They're going to destroy you. Right, he says, what are you gonna do? You're gonna set out, set out an army while the other is so long way off and ask for terms of peace. So here, here's the reality, Jordy. Here, here's, here's you, the army, the king of the army of 10,000, right? As he, and because you're here in the crowd here, you're the people Jesus is talking to, um, the people who would want to become disciples. Um, but who do you think the king of the, the other army is? the king of the army that's one day going to judge the world. Um, God, right? He's going to judge. Yeah, Jordy, God. God is going to judge the world. And he's, he's this king. And so here, the, the, the picture that Jesus paints, he says, if you're the king of this army of 10,000, you're going to send out a delegation. A delegation is, yeah, you like, yeah, you like send somebody out on like a, with like a messenger or something. Yeah, absolutely, Jordy. You're going to send somebody out meet in the middle, ask for terms of peace. Now, when you meet for the terms of peace, who's going to be dictating those terms? Is it going to be you? No, no, it's not going to be you, Jordan. It's going to be the king of the army of 20,000. Why? Because he has all the power. He could do it. He could just ignore you if you wanted to. He could just come kill everybody. He could kill your whole army. So he's going to tell you what the terms of peace are. In the same way, God doesn't, doesn't need our, our, our agreement or he doesn't need to make a deal with us. He's just going to tell, tell us how it is. And here's what he says. What, look what he says the terms of peace are. Look here, verse 33. It says, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. So what does it say the terms of peace are? Give up everything. Give up everything, Jordy. That's what the terms of peace are. And so we, here's, the, here's the thing. Jordy, he, he, Jesus paints this picture for the, uh, the crowd. But he's also painting the picture for anybody who would read this. Anybody who would read this. And Jordy, so, so on this map, right? And I, I know I said you're the king because he's talking to the you, the large crowds. But I want to ask you, Jordy, just to be, to be realistic, where would you put yourself on this map? Um, I mean, I'm, I guess you're, you're, you know, it's in the 10,000, I'm wondering what it means, but I mean, I'm kind of, I may put myself like, uh, like here or something like, 
kind of wondering what it what it means, right? Yeah. Okay, Joy. You know what? I'm gonna put you a little further because you you are you're giving your heart. I'm gonna put you right here, right right there. Okay. Um, so we're gonna put you right here. Um, here here's the thing, Jordy. If you're you're right here, which uh, uh, we'll, so we'll say you are, because this is a spiritual reality we're looking at, right? So this war that he's describing, this is a true spiritual war that we're actually in right now. So here's the thing, Jordy. If God came back right now, while we're sitting here during this Bible study, God came down and judged the world. Where would you go? Uh, where would it? Uh, nowhere good. <laughs> I don't, Jordy. You want to know? You want to know why you said nowhere good? Right? Because of how convicting and alarming it is to say I'd go to hell. But as, as real as you and I are sitting here right now, as real as these, these pages are in front of us, as this ink is on this paper, if the world ended right now, you would go to hell. Why? Because you're not with God. You're not with God. You're not a true disciple. As you yourself have admitted. How, what, what, are some, what are some ways to know a true disciple? One, do we even know what a disciple is? Two is, have you made any disciples? And Jordy, it's just the re, not the reality that you're in. But I, I appreciate you seeing it. But you got to make a decision. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Because here's the reality, Jordy. Most people, everybody starts over here in the 10,000. But you know what? Most people are like that rich young ruler in Mark 10. They want to be with God. But they want to do it on their own terms. They want to do it on their own terms. But you know, you know, Jordy, we have to do it on God's terms. And God's terms are what? Give up everything. You've got to give up everything. And then once you do that, you can join God and become a true disciple. Jordy, how, how quickly do you want to become a true disciple? I mean, it's, it's, as quickly as I can. I mean, I need to. You know what, Jordy? That's the right answer. You need to. You need to because, Jordy, the, the, the reality is that not only – you're not the first person. You're not the, the only person in this world who hasn't heard this message. You know the crazy thing, Jordy? The majority of people in the world have never seen this. Have never seen this. But – the, 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 the reality is, is that no matter where you turn from here, Jordy, no matter what you do with your life, this scripture is going to be here. This scripture is going to be here where Jesus says you have to give up everything to be a true disciple. And I want to encourage you, I want to close out with one scripture here, Jordy, in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And I do think it's important when we look at uh, the, the, the 10,000, the 20,000, to have a moment where it's, it's uh, you're making sure, you make sure they're engaged, right? It's like you got to have their, you got to make a moment, right? You got you to make a moment. Um, make sure they're, they're getting it. Don't try to rush through it because you're nervous. Like make a moment. Show them the reality of it. You know, something that hit me when I studied the Bible is that, you know, Jason sat down with me, showed me the scripture, and just, just let me stew in it. I said, I'd, and I said, I'd go to hell. And I, he said, you'd go to hell. And they're just, it's okay. Have some silence. It's okay. You don't need to sh talk every second during a Bible study, right? Have some, allow them to soak it in. See it. Understand the reality. You know, it's like, up until this point, they've never seen anything like this. Right? They've never seen all the, every Bible study it's ever been is like, you should do this. God hopes you do this. It's like they've never seen the reality that they're not saved. Right. And so I think it's something we got to understand is like how big of a deal this is. We may see you, you, you know, the scriptures, you know, the Bible study. You've done this probably. Some of you guys have been done this hundreds of times. At very least, you've been in probably a few discipleship studies. We've seen it. You sat through it. They never have. 
This is the first time they've ever seen it. This is the first time we've ever seen it. We got to make a moment. And the Luke 14 is, is that moment. We got to build up to it, right? We got to build up to it. And as far as sometimes people won't be as agreeable as Jordy. Um, so there's, there's, uh, uh, I could give you some more tools and we'll talk about that. We can talk about that off the call. Um, but uh, for, for time's sake, let's close out here in John 12. Grateful for Jordy and his, his uh, humble heart here. In John 12 and verse 47. And Jordy, I, I want to encourage you here with this scripture. Um, because, I, you know, Jordy, I, I appreciate your heart. And uh, I appreciate you really uh, um, seeing the reality, accepting the reality. But I want to share the scripture with you, John 12 here in verses 47 and 48. And Jordy, you want to close this out? Read that one. It says, as for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. And so, so Jordy, this is, what's going to happen after you leave here is you're going to be tempted to find a way out of this. It's human nature, right? We, we, we look at the scriptures, you see that God's really calling you to make serious change in your life. We're going we're gonna to try to, you're gonna, your, your, your sinful nature is going to try to grab whatever it can to keep to, to really submitting to the scriptures. You're going to go home. You're going to think of, you're going to try to think of scriptures that could get you out of this. But here's the reality, Jordy. The scriptures we looked at today are always going to be here. And as it says here, the scripture says, it says, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. Which words? The words Jesus spoke, the gospel, the, the, the discipleship message, right? The, the message we looked at today, we, we can't run from it, Jordy. We, we have to accept it. And I want to call you, Jordy, to really meditate on these scriptures. Accept them, right? I, accept them because this isn't, Jordy, at the end of the day, this isn't my standard. You know, I grew up, I never knew this. I never knew that. I went to church my whole life. I never knew this. Somebody, but somebody had, had the heart to sit down with me four and a half years ago and show me the reality. Show me, and, and by the grace of God, I had the humility at the time and the soft enough heart to really accept it, accept the teaching. And Jordan, I just want to call you to accept this because you're going to leave here tonight and you're going to, everything in your bones is going to tell you to try to find a way out. But I want to call you to accept this and let's keep studying, Jordy. Let's make you into a true disciple. When can you get together again? Uh, free tomorrow morning. Don't have class till 2. Um, okay, man, let's get together tomorrow. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Let's get on it, man. Let's go after it. How's that sound? Good. Awesome, bro. Jordy, uh, it's been great studying the Bible with you, man. I just I have, I have a lot of vision for you, bro. And uh, I know God wants to do great things with your life. And I just want to call you, call you bro, to take it one day at a time. You know, take it one day at a time, go home, meditate on these scriptures, and let's get together tomorrow. You want to pray for us? All right. Amen. Go ahead. Prayer. And that is the discipleship study. Awesome. Let's go.